This Torah class is brought to you by TorahAnytime.com. I asked someone before uh, started tonight's shear. I said, "Is there any good news in the news?" Let's talk about something positive. Enough with missing airplanes and not Shalom that we're putting away other people's pain. So he said, you know, I'm going to find you some good news. And he called me back a half hour, he's, he's still trying. He said he was very high. You have good news? Yeah. yeah? They, my, my uncle is one of the guys in charge of Geula. So he took Your the uncle's one of the guys in charge of Geula? Geula in Bukharim. In Bukharim. Two neighbors in Bukharim. Uh, right, okay. So they, he took the Moshe Leon. He used to be one of the guys that stand up to be a mayor. Yes. Now he's a big guy in the city. Uh-huh. He took him over to Yeshivas to show them. Show them Yeshivas, right. Yes. So now he said he's going to give a lot of money for them. Uh-huh. That's good news. Okay. Good news. So it's good news for the Yeshivas in Yerushalayim. Anyone else has any other money? Good news? Anything? Baruch Hashem. Okay. Schutz should be Megan on everyone. Um... So the guy came back to me afterwards. He said, you know, I have some good news. I have some good news. He said, what's the good news? He said that uh, a study came out in the New England. This is what this person told me. I'm not verified. Okay? Don't, uh, like, uh, don't change your lifestyle on the basis of this. But there's a study in the New England Journal of Medicine or something. that New England Journal of something or some other city of medicine or something along those lines. That just like there are many health risks to being overweight there are almost equal amount of health risks being underweight. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. I said, that's good news? Is yeah, you don't have to be so guilty when you eat your chocolate and she can say, you know, I, I don't want to be underweight. That's, uh, right? So you know that extra plate of spaghetti now could be healthy, right? You can, uh... So the MS is, it's like everything else in the world, overweight is not good and underweight is not good. So the weight has to be perfect. The pressure has to be perfect. It comes before Pesach, uh, everyone is under pressure. Some people under pressure for money, some, or lack of such. Some people under pressure emotionally. Some people under pressure shiduchim-wise, as many consider it a very small window in the shidduch process. Although it's a window that doesn't close shut when Pesach comes. Kids coming home uh, from, you know, seminary girls coming home from uh, Eretz Yisrael with the bills from the seminary. Uh, boys coming home. Somebody told me he was speaking to a bunch of seminary girls, like a convention of seminary girls in Eretz Yisrael. Someone said to him, just before he walked up there, he said, just remember you're speaking to $24 million over here if you figure out the schar limit of the tuition of all the people here and the uh, tickets, just know who you're speaking to. So it's it's a time of year where sometimes, and a lot of kids told me, you know, they have a bedroom all year and then their big brothers come home, their big sisters come home and now they're sleeping in the basement or sub-basement or sub-sub-basement or in the garage or something creates a lot of pressure in the house. Sometimes you have more people in the house. Um, all these are situations, and more difficult than anything else is just the, the streets. You feel the pressure on the streets. Anyone drive on 13th Avenue uh, these days? You know what it's like? Someone said it's a big parking lot. Someone said, don't let a parking lot, you don't have to worry about someone bumping into you, or you know, at least everyone's in one place. The, uh, you know, it's like going into a store these days. Somebody told me it was in a hat store, so there's screaming, yelling, pushing, shoving. And this guy is there, and he's like saying, so they announce the hats by the initials on the hat. You know, mm-hmm. is, is BGS here? Is LFU here? Is and this guy saying, he was saying something like, ADHD. A- is ADHD here? Who is ADHD? Me. Oh, you. Okay, there you go. <laughs> so you know what it's like driving on 13th Avenue these days? Yesterday I was on 13th Avenue. I found a spot, which is a almost tantamount to winning the lottery. And I pulled into the spot. Then I, you have to walk like a Tchum Shabbos to one of those muni meters. And I can make Erev Tchumen on the way. And then I go find the quarter. And, he, and it's a very frustrating. You have to walk like a half a block to one of these things. There's six people online ahead of you trying to pay. And there's one guy that was trying to put in his credit card. And he was like putting it in the wrong way and it wasn't going. And I don't know how long those people wait before you get a ticket. And finally he started jumping up and down. He said, ah, approved, approved. He was, uh, his credit card was approved for the 25 cents. Imagine, right? Without any co-signers or uh, income verification, his credit card was approved. So by the time I finally got back to my car, there were three trucks around it, all unloading their merchandise. One, Seamus, the other, Herring, and the third one, like, macaroons or something. 
and I'm like, uh, you know, really have to like get out of here. I only bought fifty cents of parking, not six years. You know, I went. Uh, relax, relax. Don't worry, don't worry, don't worry. You know, and they they they're unloading, and I was like, it was Rosh Hashanah, you know, I was totally surrounded by these trucks, and I was getting impatient. So one guy told me, you know, you can really get out between the trucks. You know, you love that when people come, they start giving you directions. Back, back, no, cut to the right, cut to the left, and they start giving you directions like this way, this way, this way. Then he goes this way, this way, this way, like <laughs> pointing at both directions at the same time. I realized, uh, you know, as I pulled out, Baruch Hashem, there were six people waiting for the spot. So there, there's a lot of pressure when this time of year comes, when Pesach comes. And I think that we have to remember, and this is a very important Nakuda, that the amount of pressure that you are experiencing at this moment, as Pesach comes in, whatever is the cause of that pressure, whether it's chas uh, shalom anxiety, or concern, or, or a sense of, you know, when are things going to turn around, or whether it's economical, emotional, shalom bias, whatever the case may be, just remember that in terms of pressure, you're not overweight, and you are not underweight. Meaning to say, that whatever your Nassayin is for this Yom Tiv, that the Rabbani Shalom has it down to, to the exact amount. You know, it was an earthquake in Chile yesterday. Was, the hearts go out to people that are in trouble, to be misfiled for them. But um, someone told me an interesting part. So how do, what's the scale called that measures uh, earthquakes? It's called the... Reichman. The Reichman? No, no. That's, that's a different fashion. No. Richter scale. It's called the Richter scale, right? Uh, four point, right? 7.2 on the Richter scale, whatever. In Yiddish... The, a judge is called a Richter, for whatever reason. So I was saying, you know, very often in our lives there are earthquakes, personal earthquakes that kind of shake things up. And uh, it measures on the Richter scale, right? You can measure an earthquake exactly what it is. How much is it shaking? Is it 7.2, 7.3? It's almost like the tsunami. Yeah, that's right, almost like the tsunami, right, Uncle Yaakov? So in, in the course of our lives, uh, there are earthquakes that rattle our cage that prevent us from being able to sleep at night. But just know that it's measured perfect. There's a Richter, there's a heavenly judge that measures it to the exact, exact amount. Just like the Yidna Mitzrayim, when the Memtes Shari Tumah, they were in the 49 gates of Tumah, and had they been there, the Arizal says, a split second longer, they would have been submerged into the Nun Shari Tumah, the 50th gate of Tumah, and it would have been the point of no return. The, the pressure that we have is also just before the point of no return. That's where HaKadosh Baruch Hu stops it. If you're alive and you're around, just remember, you're at the point of, uh, you're still at the point of return. You are where you are. What's the story? This guy he sits down by the Seder and he's like desperately hungry. His wife says, no, a Seder. He's the Amoritz of the Amoratzim in town. He is the king of all uh, Amoratzim. When I heard this story from my friend, uh, Yannis and uh, Schwartz, that there was a town that was only Amaratsim there. And actually a qualification of this town was to be an Amaratz. You were not invited into this Medrash if you were anything but an Amaratz. And uh, I don't know, the, 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 the rabbi had to be the biggest Amaratz of them all. So when I said, came Parsha Zachar, they, they took it out, and they took out the Sefer Torah, and they didn't know what to read. So you know, everyone thought it's maybe Beratius, they said a Swara, because the Chet it's a Das, everyone said a Swara, you know, apples, uh, and that's Shachmanis. Another guy said, maybe Noyach, because on Purim a lot of people sink, you know, below the table, below the chairs, they drink more and more and disappear under the table, you know. So one guy said, no, he thinks Pasha Zohar is supposed to read Tazria, because uh, it says, uh, right, Isha Ki Tazria, the Yalda Zohar, so that must be Pasha Zohar. So they decided he's right, and they read it, but then they went over to him, they said, we decided you're so right that you have to leave town, because only Amaratzim over here, right? They kind of put on that. So there was a Samoar, it's the night of the Seder, and he's sitting over there, and they said to him, you know, his wife says to him, no, Epis, say something about the Seder, say about Yisias Mitzrayim. He says, give me to eat. He says, there's plenty of food, but say something. What do you want from me? Say, he says, you give me to eat, I'll say about the Seder, okay? So they give him to eat, so she gives him to eat, and then more and more and more, and he finally packs everything down, he finishes it all off, and then they're saying to him, and he says, no, you promised. So he gets up, he goes to bed. He's leaving to go to the bedroom. He says, you promised. He says, you want to know about the Seder? I say, Parah, as long as they had a, held the gun to his head, he promised the world. As soon as they took the gun away, he said, ha ha, too bad. Okay? So that's the Seder. I'm like Parah. You know what I mean? As long as you didn't give me the food, I'm going to tell you. Now you gave me the food, too bad. Too late. Right? That's the Seder. Right? That's the whole story of see as Mitzrayim. The, the, the pressure that we are feeling is supposed to be pressure that brings us, not, not that we're trying to get rid of the pressure and run away from it, but we have to understand that the pressure is guiding us. Um, I'll share something with you. I, I had to give a share 
Um, wonderful, wonderful organization. I want to get into Pratim, but it was a shear, like a chizik shear, and I kept pushing it off and pushing it off and pushing it off and pushing it off. Finally, I was down to the last day, or whatever, I was supposed to give the shear. And whatever, I made up, I'm going to get up at 6 o'clock in the morning, 5 o'clock in the morning, I think it was, to be able to record the shear, and I did get up at 5 o'clock in order to press the snooze button. So by 7 o'clock, I was out of bed. I'll tell you that many times. The guy said, you know, my Sahara. I made up, I'm waking up at 5 can you imagine? I battled with the Yetzir Sahara in bed nine, five hours. Get up, don't get up. Then after five hours, I won. Got up. From that point on. So I, by the time I got up, there was like 7.30, and I was already late to yeshiva, and I had to do this recording on the phone. And when I was told that if you press star 88, it avoids the beep, I don't know. I guess I was off by a number, because I must have pressed the button that generates beeps, because every two seconds somebody else was calling in, kept blocking out this year. And then something went wrong, the lines got crossed, even though I was on line two, so it came up on line one, and as I was getting to the punchline of my shear, so someone said, you know, you have the homework, you know, I was calling my little daughter. <laughs> and finally, when I had the phone for myself, and I was really running out of time, because I do have to be in yeshiva, outside there are the slew of garbage trucks. I think all six showed up at the same time. The left side of the street, the right side of the street, the recycling, the not recycling, the in-between, and the inspectors. And there was such hunting going on outside that a mamish could not get, uh, couldn't get a thing in uh, real, real, uh, real loud. It's amazing. I've been out of town in places. You can go three days, you don't hear a car horn. And uh, here, if you don't hear a car horn, you, you want to check your hearing right away. It's, uh, I was glad in Atlanta, and uh, like they were saying to me, this is like really, I was amazed. And a car like slung, slung by, like sizzled by, and uh, with a blaring horn. And sure enough, we looked and had New York plates. I guess that was also part of the cure to make me, uh, make me feel at home. You know what it's like driving out of town? I remember I was in New Hampshire, and there's a long line of cars. An accident? No. People are waiting to get off the exit. So they, they pull into the right lane as the exit approaches, and people wait. That's not the way you do it over here. Everyone piles up at the same time, and you try to cut each other off at the last minute. Right? You know, it's a great feeling. Another feeling when you pull over for an ambulance behind you, as the ambulance zooms by, 30 cars are coming and you can't get back in because they're all fighting a mahar. Or a guy in a busy street waiting for parking because he thinks someone's getting into his car, so he stops and waits for that guy to get out. Line of cars 30 blocks behind him, he's waiting for this guy. Don't, uh, don't convince me anything, uh, anything different. So there's pressure. There's a lot of pressure on the street. And because there's a lot of pressure on the street, there's a bigger responsibility on us to act accordingly. And when you're under pressure and you want to cut someone off and you don't because you don't want to make a chil Hashem, so that, that's the purpose of your pressure. That's where you're being kinda. That's where you're doing Well, anyway, I am just finally, finally getting ready for the shear and I realize i got to run tissue. There's nothing like when you're left in Yiddish there's an expression with the tzing and you know, you have something to say and you come back from yeshiva, I get up there, this is like the deadline of all deadlines. I really got to get this shear done. And I, I start to give my idea and all of a sudden I hear this rambunctious, abrasive, loud noise. What is that? Coming out of the gardener. You know, he wasn't here all, all winter, and now he comes. You know that thing they come with the, that big vacuum cleaner that they pull up the leaves with? Ooh. It makes this... Bzz, it, oh, you see? I'm cleaning out what it's like, right? It measures 9.10 on the Richter scale. And I'm like trying to do this shit, and I'm screaming at him, go away! And he says, no, no, boss says to come now. He says, tell boss not now. No, you pay. You know what? I pay. You go away, I pay. Okay? Yeah, you go right, right now, I'll pay for it. I'm desperate to finish this year. Okay, so he packs up his bags, he goes. Where does he go? Goes across the gate to the neighbor. Start doing it over there. So I can't send them away from the neighbor. So by now, I'm just about had it. I'm saying, what does the Rosh Hashanah want from me? I'm, I'm trying to do this shear. And I sit down, and I'm about to do the shear, and of course, my phone starts buzzing away. I forgot to close the buzzer. I don't like closing the buzzer, because if you close it, and I forget to open it, then you miss calls, sometimes important calls, but then again, you don't want to take it into davening with it buzzing in your pocket. So I try to leave my phone out of the room when I go to daven. They have these beautiful things. They have these lockers. I went into a shul. They have these lockers for phones. You put the phone in. You close it. Special phones just made for, for lockers. I was in Satmer in Lakewood. They have it. I was in, I was in um, an Avenue S. Uh, it's, it's really a beautiful thing. You put your phone in. Forget about it. That's it. Uh, I heard that someone is willing to pay for it even. Or the cost. Oh yeah, at, at, at cost. So I try to leave the phone. But now it's like jumping up and down, I'm grabbing the phone. And the reason I don't take it to shul, I, usually, usually, is because I think what really got me is when I once saw someone davening, and he was holding his tzitzis to his ear and kissing the phone. 
I realize that you can really get carried away from... Uh, so, I don't answer the phone, and I'm turning off the buzzer, and I'm trying to do this recording, and the phone is lighting up, lighting up, and there's a text coming through. Who is this? And uh, it's actually a friend of mine, a very close friend of mine, a big Talmud Chacham. And he says to me, you have a minute? And I said, no, and I hung up. And I said, that was not nice of me. Because that is contrary to whatever I was saying. So what I'm doing is I'm also pushing into a parking spot. It's not his fault that I'm under pressure now. So I call back right away. And uh, he says to me, you okay? Yeah, yeah I'm okay. Can I help you? I said, yeah, but you're the third person that called now, and I have to finish this. He says, no problem. You don't want to talk to me? He's niche. I didn't say I don't want to talk to you. Getting upset? No. I am upset. Already. No. It's not your fault. I'm sorry. Tell me. How can I help you? He says, so he says to me, and this is the third time that day someone said it, he said, I heard a shear from you like 10 years ago, and I was wondering what the Makar is. I'm thinking to myself, Rabbi Nishalev, for 10 years you're walking around with this question. You couldn't, you couldn't wait 10 years and, and an hour. Like, you know, you have to call right now and I have to do this recording. So I told him, you know, I told him the story, you know, the guy in the, in the, uh, in the Museum of Natural History, he's giving a tour, and he says, the dinosaur, this dinosaur is 65 billion, one and a half years old. I said, so, you know, where's the one and a half from? He says, he started working here a year and a half ago, and they told him it was 65 billion years old, so now it's 65 billion a year and a half, you know. So he's, he's, he says to me, you know, you don't want to hear me? Fine. I said, I'm just you're the third person that called, you know, and I'm trying to finish this year. I said, you know, we could have been over this already. You want to answer me? Don't answer me. Fine, answer me. Right, you're, for 10 years you have this question and you have to have the answer right now. What is your question? Tell me. I think he's calling right now. He must be hearing this. Okay. So he says, my question is about something that I said on a year, which I have no clue. I don't remember even saying it. And he asks me the question. And as he's finishing, and I'm explaining it to him, I said, listen, I've got to get back to my shear. He goes, well, according to what you would say in one of your shiurim, if after 10 years I thought of asking you this now, it's probably you're supposed to hear this now. But instead of you saying that, you're screaming at me. I said, I am not screaming at you. No, you're getting like uptight. I said, I'm not getting uptight. Then he hung up the phone and I said, he's right. And he's right. If, if, if after 10 years he thought of asking me now, it must be something that I have to say now. So let me tell you what he asked me, and let me tell you what I did with it. Um, it was a shear from like 10 years ago. It, it was actually more of a halacha shear about a middle of Shimon Esrei. Really, al pi halacha, by each brach of Shimon Esrei, you're allowed to add something. Uh, for, for instance, in the brach of Rafa'enu, you can add your own words, as he writes in the say, but technically speaking, you can add your own words about Rafu'a for an individual. So Shaila, Lashi Yacha, Lashi Rabbim. In the bracha of Baruch Aleinu, you can technically, I say technically because we don't necessarily do it, but you can add your own uh, bracha for Parnasa, and so on and so on. Um, by Shemei Atfil, of course, it's uh, carte blanche. You can add for anything, because that's all included in the Tfil. However, the Paiskin, a little skeptical about allowing us to do it. And there's a variety of different reasons. And one reason is, you know, it's a very big uh, achrayis, to add words to tefillah. That's why technically you're allowed to daven at tefillah and the but we don't do it. Why don't we daven at tefillah and the They donate an extra Shmon Esri. They're saying, like, I don't see how good you're doing with the Shmon Esri, that you have to daven. What are you adding on Shmon Esri? And basically, if you're a Shmon Esri, as we have said many times, look something like this, Baruch Hashem, oh no, I parked the car on the wrong side of the street, Lekei Lekei was saying, oh, it's old and it's high today, Lekei Amra, my wife is going to kill me, another ticket, Lekei Yitzchak, Lekei Yitzchak, suspended today. Oh, Baruch Hashem, Akela, God, Elagib, Ravaner. No, not today. Last week it was suspended. Oh, wait a second. No, no, my son took the car today. Okay, has the other maybe girl. But he brought it back. Of maybe a maybe a hava, and he told me he's double parking. And now a chayzer mishiyam lager. Right. So that's what your shmonesser looks like. There's major problems. So what's our saving grace? We can say, I'm trying, and you told me I have to daven, and this is Mansfield. I have no choice. That's a little bit of a. Not an excuse, but it's a little bit of a piece. But if you're adding a shmo- words into Shmanesri on your own, and then you don't have Kavana, then that's the marshal, like it says, if, you know, if you're massacring you all these strong Shmanesri, you're knocking on the king's door, the king opens up the door, and you run away. So, Mimela, we're not so excited about adding words to Shmanesri because of our, perhaps, uh, inability to maintain the proper Kavana as it would be necessary. Besides, for the Indian, that each, the Yanchik Nesagdala, we're massacring the uh, Brachis of Shmanesri, and each one has a precise amount of words, and so on. However, the Paiskim do suggest that there is a place where you can freely uh, add your own tefillahs. And if you still want it, because you can always daven to Hashem, but if you want it to be kind of in part of Shemanesri, and that's during a Lekei 
And after you say the words Yilaratsain, before you say the words Asay Laman Shemecha, Asay Laman Yuminecha, Asay Laman Teresecha, Asay Laman Kiddushasecha, so Al Pi Halacha, you can add your own tefillas, and you actually should add your own tefillas. You should dive in every day. The Mishnah Baruch says, Shalom Yamashat Torah and Pizari and Zarazari. And it's, it's really a time, and I always try to make a mental list in my mind of like 10 things that I want to ask for. Right? If I was standing in front of uh, the richest person in the world who was writing me a check, I would think what I need now. So if you really have the proper amuna, so stop. Stop for a second and think. The mile of doing it over here is, is that, uh, first of all, according to many sheets, you can answer them. When you and you have like the mile of being part of Shmon right? Yet you're yeah. not really in the middle of the brachis where it's such an Indian if you didn't have the proper kavana. Now, now there was a vart which I said, it says to really be mechavein, when you say the words, I say, leman shemecha, say leman yeminecha, say leman teresecha, say leman kiddush asecha. Why? Because it's kilu mekabel p'nei ha-shechina. And the mechaber even brings that. What does that mean? Kilu mekabel p'nei ha-shechina. So this was the word he was asking me about. He was asking me for a makar, which I am going to still look for. But I, I definitely saw it in one of the svarim. That it comes to this part of Shmon Esrei, so we say, you know, I'm asking you for Parnassah, I'm asking you for Rafua, I'm asking you for Kivas Goliath, I just finished one yesterday, and you feel like you blew it. I don't have the level of Amunah, I don't have the level of Betachan I'm supposed to have, I don't have the level of Simcha that I'm supposed to have, and you feel like, you know, I, you know, Hashem is not interested in me. So the trick is, stop right there, stop where you are, and say, Kodesh Baruch Hu, okay? This is my pain, this is my frustration, this is my pressure, this is my fear. This is my ruchniistic struggles. And you, you got to help me. And you know why you got to help me? Because there is a concept, the Balatanya talks about this as well, of shechinta begalusa. What does it mean that shechinta is in galus? The marshal that the Svarim say is as follows. That suppose you're marooned someplace. You know, you're, you're in an airline and the plane comes flying down, unexpected landing, in the middle of nowhere. I shouldn't even repeat this story, but I have a friend, he didn't want to go on, uh, whatever, he was going into Shaduch, and he was from more Hasidish family, and his parents were of the mindset to stay in, you don't go out on a date. And he was seeing a particular uh, girl, a very fine girl, but she wanted to go out, for whatever reason, she felt that it would be more comfortable, so he made up sure he was going out, but he wanted to make sure that no one sees him going out. So he drove like two hours to some remote uh, lounge of a hotel, someplace away from wherever they were staying. Um, as the good Lord would have it, uh, there was a flight coming from two cities in New York that had to make an emergency landing in an airport right near this hotel. And on this flight were like 50 or 60 members of a very Hasidish family and their kids that were all brought to the hotel overnight. So he tells me, you know, the reason I came to this hotel is because, like, I don't mind going on a date, but I, I really, I can't afford anyone seeing me, so I had to, like, run away, and he looks up, and the door opens up, and in walks his whole extended family, all his cousins and everyone, and he goes, but then again, you can't really run away, right? She says, what do you mean? Turn around. She turns around, and she goes, oh, no, oh, no. <clears throat> so imagine you're marooned someplace, Okay and you are put into a hotel room overnight. There's no, there's no, and you're in the hotel room with the prince. You're in the hotel room with the king. And because of circumstances, that's it. You and him are there. So like you're, 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 there's a certain sense of uncomfort. So you're on the phone, and you're calling home, and you're upset, and you want to start using vulgar language, and you go, oh. hey, how come, and you turn it like, how's everything, what's doing, have a pleasant evening. His wife says, you feeling all right? Why are you talking that way? He goes, there's a king in the room, a prince, I, I got it. And then you're like being, you know, you're more idle about what you're doing, and you're getting into bed. Whatever your issues are, you know, uh, so, oh, I hope I don't snore tonight, you know, like, I hope I don't, I, 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 you, you, you like, you know, you're, you're careful to be clean, you're careful to brush your teeth, you're, you're careful, like, you, you just have a sense of, I, I got to live to a higher standard, because look who's with me in the room. The, there is such a concept, of course it's a marshal, but the shechinta begalisa, that the shechina is in galas. Because the Shechina is in Golis, the Shechina is with me. So I'm a roommate, Kaviyachl, with the Kaddish Baruch Hu. And therefore, what I'm saying is, Rabbi Yishalayim, I'm going through a lot right now. I, 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 I don't want to offend the Shechina. And because I'm in Golis together with the Shechina, the Shechina is, is with me. So we're saying, Asei Laman Shemecha. 
The Rebbein Shalolim, like, I represent you, okay? I'm wearing a yarmulke. I'm wearing a hat. I'm wearing tzitzes, whatever it is. I'm dressed sneistic. So I become a from person. Because I represent your name, so help me be Mekad Hashem Shemayim. And I, I may not be in a position because of my temperament, because of the way I drive, because of the way I act, or because of things are my fault or not fault, or because of my own sveikas and amuna. I'm not acting the way I can, but I say Laman Shemecha for your covet. Help me. You know, the, the ones came to the Satmar Rebbe, they told him about a certain... Uh, "Quote unquote," uh, person that declared himself a rebbe, uh, that you know he's giving brachas. The brachas are fulfilled. So the rebbe said, you know, there once was a peasant that he came to the palace and he saw the guard. He never saw a guard before. He sees these guys with shiny buttons and a sword. He was sure it's the king. He goes, "Your Majesty, please grant me the farm, please." This guy's like, you know, humoring him. He says, "You can have the farm. Can I have the windmill? Can I have the windmill? Can I have like the hotel near the ocean? That not, you know? <laughs> oh, Your Majesty, thank you. No problem." Everyone's laughing their heads off when they told the king about it. So they said to the king, "The king said, listen, you got to give him the windmill. You got to give him the farm, because he thinks the king gave it to him." So it's a chil Hashem if he doesn't get it. But is this guard going to get patched, you know, for uh, imitating the king? Okay, so we're saying this with People think I'm a from person. So, give me the kayach, that I'm not mechal shem shemayim. Yeminecha. Yeminecha is the rachmim. I don't know we see the rachmim. We don't see the rachmim. We don't have the seichel to see the rachmim. But it shouldn't be a chil Hashem. Right? A lot of times uh, if a bus or a big tractor trailer has to make a right turn, he swings to the left and then comes around. Right? Not that he can't make the turn. And some of the it looks like we're asking for something and it's going in the complete opposite direction. And we don't understand that in order to make that turn, you have to do it. I was saying, you want me to learn? You want me to have a shear? You know, there's no bitl taira. You gotta help me. You know, you're right here. I should have wrong machshabas in my mind. I'm uncomfortable. There's a famous story, right? The house of Elijah. Reb Chaim Volozhin, and, 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 and they write the whole Volozhin and the whole uh, dynasty, the, you know, the, or Brisk, I'm sorry, the whole, the whole Brisk dynasty. Where did it come from? That uh, the Shagas Arya was in a certain house, he was in Gaulis, and they came down and they said to him, Mazel Tov, you should know a baby was just born upstairs. The baby was born, it was very quiet. It <coughs> shows that the, the mother held back her Chevle Leida, she didn't scream and yell in pain, because she said the Shagas Arya is learning downstairs, she didn't want to disturb it. That was up the whole Shalshalis of Brisk started from there. So, uh, one, one, the story along those lines. So I remember one of my rebbeim once said, "Imagine the reward if we won't allow certain machshavos to go into our head, or we're saying I can't look at that because the shechina is with me in the same room. If that, just like she said, I don't want to stare the shagas arya. How much more so? We don't want to stare the the shechina, and we see kama mishalim in the medrash, right? That famous medrash. This the king is." stuck in the middle of the woods and the peasant takes him in and gives him fire and he warms and, and he gives him figs to eat, that's all he had was figs and the next day he's summoned to the palace and he comes to the palace and doesn't know what he did wrong and the king tells him, ah, it was me who you saved for every fig that you give me I give you a gold bracelet, you know, for every this that you gave me, I give you a gold thing and he came home with a basket full of gold, he was rich forever after so his next door neighbor got a real spanking, for, a real screaming at from his wife, bawling out and said, Yushla Mazla, our neighbor goes, he gives the king some figs the king, you realize the king pays for every fig million of dollars, so he takes the things of figs and he brings it to the king. The king says, "What are you bringing me figs for?" He says, "I heard, heard that you pay gold bracelets for every fig." He said you, he said, "That's because I was alone and lost in the woods, and he saved my life." He said, "You're coming to me with figs. You think I need your figs?" So they punished him. They put him up against the corner. And everybody came by and pelted him with the figs. So when he came back and he told his wife what happened, he was real angry at her. She said, "Look, be happy you didn't bring him a sroigim. You know what I mean? Imagine what would have happened then." Says so like the Medrash. So clearly, what's the Medrash trying to say? That do, do we understand that because the Shechina is in Golis, and, there are, and, and what we offer the Shechina, of course there's a deeper meaning that the Shechina goes into Golis, but Dafka to give us this opportunity. And so the Rabbani Shem goes into Golis, so to speak, goes into the woods, and is lost. So we, in the worst of our Matzif, and we're saying, but the Rabbani Shem is right next to me, I can't do this. And that, to a certain degree, is the contrast on Pesach, before Chatzais and after Chatzais. Before Chatzais we talk about Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim, after Chatzais, we talk about the Pesach of La'asid Lovely. They were saying Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim meant that Kalal Yisrael had to go into B'Shval HaMatzif. They really had to sink very, very low into the Memte Shari Tumah to understand the Niva Le'achar, that HaKadosh Baruch Hu is coming to take them out. And therefore there were certain things they held themselves back. If God came to take me out, He's here now, there's certain things I can't do. 
and the, and the, the, the Kiddush Hashem, the reward that HaKadosh Baruch Hu pays for you when you're in the dumps, in your machshav and in your heart, and in your relationship with HaKadosh Baruch Hu, and you say, but I can't do this anymore. How much do you get paid for every fig? So the Chesam says an interesting word. When we step out Shmon Esrei, we bow to the left. Why? Because we're opposite the Shechina. Okay, so you should say, so right should never be chashav, because you're always opposite the Shechina, so always go to the left. Right? We know, the kayan goes up on the right side. According to this chesh, the shechina is always a funny, so we should always go to the left. That should be more chesh. So he says, there's a different nekud over here. So when we step out Shmon Esrei, you may think, oh, Hashem is dumping us. I just dumped the Shmon Esrei. I, have no feel, I don't feel like Hashem listened to me. I don't feel like anything happened. We're, we're bowing down to the left. And the Kaddish Baruch Hu says, I know you're massive. And I know the sveikas you have to go through. And I know the trials and tribulations you have to go to. to. This is the bus swinging to the left in order to make the right turn. We are opposite the shechina. For us, it looks like our life is going left. But a Kaddish Baruch Hu says, trust me, right now it is going right. Every machshav, every dibber, every mice, every nesoy, and every ounce of uh, frustration, apprehension, fear, is tailor-made for us to have a tikkun on what we have to accomplish. And that's why, like we discussed last week, there's really only one Pesach in your life. Because your, what's going on in your life right now, the things you're anxious about, the things you're worried about, the things you're happy about, the, the things you're... It, it, it's never going to be the same combination. And this is your Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim. This is your Shechina Begolus. You know, the Rambam says that if you believe that things just happen by chance, you're an achzer. You, what does it mean you're an achzer? You're mean. Because the Kaddish Baruch is doing all of this to help you, to wake you up. I, I was once driving, years ago, I was a kid, and I was sitting in the back seat, and I got a ride with someone who had a fancy car. What was a fancy car when I was a kid? Any, anyone remember the windows that you have to you have to turn? You have the windows up or down. You know, you have to turn the handle. Most you remember? Still you remember? Still have it, right? Okay, still have the handle. Yeah. Um, so I remember. I wasn't a kid. I was a bucher, and I was driving. Someone lent me this quote fancy car, and I was giving a man on my block a ride. We were going to a chas, and we came to the toll booths. No easy pass in those days. And I was trying to open the window to pay the toll. Okay? So there were four of these buttons, and of course I pressed the wrong button, and the window in the back seat came down. Mm-hmm. And the guy said, Oh, I'm sorry, no, I, he thought I was like being Miramison, actually more than being Miramison, a, a pal, you know, I'm giving it a ride, you know, I'm paying for the gas, see the toll booth? And the guy was like, Oh, oh, I'm sorry, said, no, 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 I didn't mean, I just, I, no, 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 no. He said, No, no, I understand, I said, No, no, really, I just I opened your window by mistake, right? No, 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 it's okay, you know. <laughs> you know, when your window goes down, Hashem is like telling us, no, do it now. Now we can buy it. And it always says a story, you know, Reuven tells Shimon, don't be ever wake me up, okay? Shimon tries to wake him up. You know, it doesn't work. He's pouring buckets of water on him. It doesn't work. He's throwing him off the bed. It turns over the mattress. It doesn't work. You know, finally he wakes up two hours later. He says, why did you wake me up? He says, I dumped bottle after bottle of water on you. I threw you over on the floor. What do you want me to do? He says, I was dreaming, Taka, that someone threw water on me, you know, poured water on the floor. So what's going on in our life is the Kaddish Baruch is telling us, stop, 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 the window's going down. This is your Nisayan. This is your moment. It's only you. It's no one else. Right? So the Gemara says, Echi Dami Bal Tshuva. Machvei Rabbi Yehuda, Rabbi Yehuda showed, he said, in your situation, that a Kaddish Baruch Hu rotates you where you're in a situation of Oisa Isha, Oisa Perik, Oisa Mok. That you're, 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 you're whatever the woman which represents the type that he was Nechshel in, that time period and that place. And there are things that we have to go through in our lives to get back to three different Nekudais. And that is Oilam Shana Nefesh, person, place, and time. And all three have to click in order for us to do tshuva. And sometimes we're saying, what is the Kaddish Baruch Hu doing to me? Why are you sending me here? Why does this have to happen? I'm driving back from Lakewood. So I have this thing, I like to go off to get gas, and cheap gas in New Jersey, cheaper gas, because I'm Jewish, right? But of course you could stop at the Garden State, but the gas stations off the highway are even cheaper than the big gas station on the guys. And I always do this. I always, right before the Outer Bridge crossing, I go off into Perth Amboy, and I get helplessly lost. Okay, and I wind up using up a whole half a tank of gas trying to find the gas station with the cheaper gas. So, as usual, I try again, and the GPS was like, gave up on me. He just said, just give up. And, I don't know, you get there's like bridges, I don't know where I was. And at the end, as I, instead of getting back onto the Outer Bridge, I wind up on the New Jersey Turnpike. And, of course, I could come across with the gaffles. I don't want to bore you here too much. 
and I'm, I'm driving. And all of a sudden, I see like to the, as I'm coming to before the Verizon, I'm seeing to the right side of me, there's like 10 cars lined up on the side of the road. And there was a big pothole over there. And it was just zets after zets after zets. After, there must be 10 cars in a row, all got flats. It was like a crater in the road, and they came and they, the police stopped it, and they were, whatever, they were doing the emergency work. And I realized, you know, if you come off the, if, if you're coming from that approach, you're always on the right side of the Staten Island Express. You know what I mean? If, you, if you're coming from the Outer Bridge Crossing. I said, I would have been there. Right? And I would have had another story for you with a flat tire guy. And I said, but because I was coming from the Gothels, I probably was, I, I know, I don't change lanes so quickly. You know, I'm not from the big lane changer. You know? I said, I was, on the, I was on the side of the highway that didn't have the holes because I got lost in the New Jersey Turnpike. I said, if we have Seichel to understand that where you are is a Kaddish Baruch Hu is leading you. Here, Seichel, here. I say Makayim, I say Eish, I say Isha. Why am I here? Why am I stuck? Why are you stuck? I brought you here. I'm trying to help you. And that's why we say, says the Satmar of Zechra Sadiq Lavracha, Baruch HaMakayim Baruch Hu. Baruch Shanos entirely Ami Yisrael. What does HaMakayim mean? Baruch HaMakayim. That the Rabbi Nishlam is the Makayim of the entire world. And wherever every single person is, wherever you are sitting right now, wherever you are listening to this in any venue, whatever is going on in your life, and with whom you are sitting, and where you are, and when you are, is all Baj Gach and the floor, as is every th- single thing in your life. And sometimes we ask a thousand questions, why me? And the Kajmarik will say, because I'm helping you. And that's the Baruch HaMokon, the Baruch that's typhus, the entire Mokon, the entire world, and, 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 and circulates everything and rotates everything that we should be at the right place. That's the Baruch Shanas and Tareli Yama Yisrael. Because we each have a tafkit to do, we each have a mission to do, you have to be, in, and we probably blew it in the previous Gilgal. As the Arizal says, most of us are here for the second time. And the Rabbi Shalom has to create whatever it is in terms of pressure, in terms of frustration, in terms of getting lost, in terms of miscalculations, so we are at the right place at the right time. <coughs> so the Chacham says like this, right? Chacham says, Ma edis So everyone has the same cash. There's not much of a difference here between the Chacham and the Russia. So what makes one a Chacham and not the Russia, right? It's not what you know. So well, you know what makes you a Chacham, you a Russia. So the Zatma Rebbe teaches like this. Chacham says like this. Every single person in the world is here for a tafkin, okay? You put on tefillin, I put on tefillin. But what I have to accomplish with my tefillin is not what you have to accomplish with your tefillin. We each have our own sign. So he says, The Chacham looks around at everyone here and doesn't hold himself bigger than everyone else. He says, Every single one of you sitting here has a different sign and a different accomplishment in this world. I want to learn what that accomplishment is. And Hashetziva Hashem Elekeinu, Hashem is Midas Arachmim, Elekeinu is Midas Adin. There are things going your way, and there are things not going your way. And it's all the Hashgach and the flaw. And someone that has an appreciation for everyone around him, he wants to learn, he wants to learn from the people around him. And that's the Kenegad Abba Bonim Dibratari, why do I have to deal with a Chacham? Why do I have to deal with a Rosh? You got the Chacham, I get the Rosh, I get the Shang, I get this Chabrus, I get that Chabrus, I get this Chabrus. Everything is a Hashgach. And you know something else? I want saw a thief of art. We are the Abobon. Abobon and In our lives, there are times in our lives we are the Chacham, there are times in our lives we are the Rasha, there are times we are the Tam, there are times we are the She'eni Deil Lisha. And that is all a chilek of the Hashgach. I saw this beautiful story in the Tarit Tavlin that there was a man who came from uh, Europe to try to make Parnassah. Him and his partner hit, hit it off bid. They had a great import export business. They made a killing. In three years, they had enough money to go back to Poland and live rich the rest of their life. As the person is about to return home, he gets this telegram that his father died, Rahman son. He sits down, he's sitting shiva, he's old Sabrachim. And his partner comes to him, and his partner says, you know, he says to the partner, I'm not supposed to talk about business, everything going okay? Yeah, the contracts, everything, I'll take care of it. One thing you have to sign here. He's all, he goes, let me just sign it. Thanks to the partner for taking care of the business for the seven days. And then he realizes what he signed. He signed over his, uh, his whole chalik in the business to the partner for free. Good. And he knew that he was an availus, he's not going to think. And of course, the partner took off, and he was to Zetz. And then, not only that, he couldn't go back to his family. How does he explain to his family why he was away all these years? And he is broken, and he is smashed. And after a long time of, why, God, why did you do this to me? So he has no choice. He has to try to, he doesn't have the money to get home, even if he wants to go home. And meanwhile, his visa runs out. His visa runs out, so he had to start working on citizenship. If not, he wouldn't be able to stay here any longer. So he managed to get citizenship. And he managed to start a small business, worked himself up to the point where he had enough money to go back to Poland. Then when the World War II broke out, um, he was able to come to America because he was a citizen. 
his partner, the rich partner who was, got him to sign during the Shiva, could not come to America. He wasn't a citizen. He came to America and he had to start working for his family. And he, he wound up, you know, you know, where all stories go, they got onto the last boat. Boy, that last boat must have been very full. But, you know, we all get onto the last boat. You know, he got his whole family out. But here's the trick, okay? What was the duration of time from the moment he got up from Shiva and he was told, guess what, you don't have a business left. Your partner just, you know, he did to you. Until he realized this is what saved his family, right? Ten years, fifteen years. All of our nesiyayinus in life are between that beginning and between the end. Between the major disappointment in life, up until the time that we see it all falls into place. Now, how long it takes for us to see how it fell into place, or whether we see it on this world or in the Eidam MS, is irrelevant. Our job is to believe that somewhere in the middle, this is where it is. You are in the middle. You are between the disappointment and the time that you're going to see the hashgacha. Understanding that you're in the middle, this gives you the kayach to be able to hold on. Rabbi Aaron Kato Zechot Tzadik Levracha came off the boat when they were running in the war. The only way to get to the port, there was a very narrow rope bridge that went back and forth, back and forth. I said the story once, it sounds like driving in your car. No, it's not that bad, come on, cut it out. <laughs> and he said, he, at one point he was like scared to go. You remember, you were slipping on, on the, you slipped, you went into the water. So he picked up the bags and he said, look what I have, I have my, my, my chidushin. I have to replant Torah in America. And he ran across it. You know, at the point that you realize this is just a means of one place to another, there's a courage that comes, there's a kayak that comes to you. We are all, any disappointment in your life, just remember, you're in between the story of the disappointment and the story of how you see how you're going to save the family. We are the Abba Bonin. There are times in our life that we, we question. We don't always have the, the level of Amun that we should have. And can I get a Bob on in Dibra Taira? The Taira says, I know there are going to be times that a person's a Russia. One person's a Russia, be my son, unfortunately. One person be Machshava. One be Dibra. One is just a fleeting moment of Safik. But that's a chalik of the Hashgacha. And there are times there are Shani, they we don't even know what to ask. There are times there are Tam, where times there's Aichet Chachma. And the trick is a Kenegad Abob, one in Debra Taira, that each is a chalik in the Hashgacha of our life. So what do we have in this week's of Taira? We have the four. Mitzayrai, four uh, right Mitzayrus. Your Gachzi and his sons, and Elisha told them that Saras Naman is going to stay with them ad oilam forever. Everyone's dying of hunger, and they're it's type of dying of hunger. They're in the Mitzayrus cabin outside of the town, and they look at each other. And what do they say? They say Ma Nachnu Yoshim Pai. At Masna we're going to sit until we die. Let's go. Let's go on the Machna of Aram. Let's attack them. You're going to attack the Machna Aram. That's great. You're going to attack the Machna. What do you think your chances of survival are? If you're going to attack the Machna Aram. Tell me. I don't know. We'll try. We'll try. Yeah, great. They said we stay here. If I die, we go there. We'll probably die. But at least we tried. So it takes a tremendous amount of courage when you're a Mitzoyra, and in your life it looks like you're going to be a Mitzoyra forever. You know there. Whatever people said about me, it's never going to go away. I, I'm paying such a price. So you get up and you try to live. When you do that, you always find brachas. So they come to the Machna Ram, and what happened in the Machna Ram was they heard voices. They said, uh oh, uh oh, the Jews hired a bunch of people to come attack us. They run for their lives. And everything is there. Even though they're in the town, everyone's dying of hunger. The whole place is full of any kind of supply you can want, all the food in the world. So they sit down and they start eating, and, they're, and they go, well, we're going to be in trouble if we don't share this with our friends. So they turn around and they run back. And they say, guess what? Machna Ram is, is available. You know, there's no one there. There's no one home. It's open. You know, go, go, go get it. You know, the biggest fort in the country. That's it. Fort Dix is open. That's it. Come for the taking. It says, you know, fire sale. Leftovers all for free. Come take it. Come and get it. So what does the king say? He's not sure. He's not sure that uh, whatever it's a trick. They want to trick us to come out, then they're going to attack us. So at the end, they send uh, two of the five horses that are left. Right? Wait, 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 exactly the, the Sukkim saying. And the word gets out, no that it's all, everybody charges out, and they all have the food, and there's only one person that gets trampled. Who's the one person that gets trampled? He is the person that when Elisha came and said, don't worry, that tomorrow the food is going to be so cheap, you're going to see, everyone's going to have it. So this one guy said, what are you hacking a cup, Elisha, with your, what are you naive, what are you draining a cup? He says, you don't understand the political situation over here, you don't understand the food shortage, you don't understand the rationing, you don't understand the economy, what are you draining me with your Nevoa? He said uh, that God's going to open the windows of the heaven, there won't be that much food. What are you giving the people false hope for? And Elisha said, you're not going to get to see it. And the next day they all charged out, and there was so much food available that the, the price of food came crashing on the market, and he was trampled. This 
Sholish, this one that was in charge, it said that he was trampled. There's a Gemara Masechus Pesachim that says that despite the fact there was such a small area in the base Hamikdash, everyone came in for the carbon Pesach, and they were up against the deadline, you would think Chas Hashem, people should be trampled. It never ever happened, with the exception of one time that a Zok and Echad was trampled. Says the Arizal, who was that Zok and Echad? He was the Shalish. He was the Nisham of this person who told the people, forget it, there's never going to be, Elisha doesn't know what he's talking about, there's never going to be enough food, and he was trampled then, but he didn't have his full ticket yet. He had to come down to this world, live a whole life, to be trampled once again, to be mashlim, his tikkun, of taking it away. Now understand the midah keneged midah over here. If by telling people, no, there's no hope for you, don't you understand, it's never going to get better. One is trampled. Then going around and being mechazic others, and giving people life, and saying, it's going to get better, hang in there, so God Baruch Hu lifts you. It's a Metzius. It has to be that way. Some Rebbe once said a beautiful, I almost saw this as, uh, as I read it, one of his svarim. It says, all the shuls are going to Yerushalayim. Mashiach is going to come. Every single shul goes where? To Yerushalayim. Right? I once heard an appeal. This guy's making an appeal. They wanted a new floor in the shul. It wasn't going very well. He said, the day is going to come. Every single shul is going to go to Yerushalayim and you're all going to be embarrassed because this floor is going to crumble underneath us. The shul is going to pick itself up but we're going to be left over here, you know, open. You're going to see. That was his pitch for a new floor. Every shul, a seed in Batik, and a seed in Batik, and a seed in Batik, and a seed in So he said, every Yiddish house, every good house, the people care. So I'm going to go to Yishalayim, when Sheikh is going to come. So he said, what's the Makar? So the Makar is a Kalvachayim. Madach shul, where sometimes you serve Hashem, sometimes you don't. Sometimes we daven, sometimes we don't. Sometimes there's a minion, sometimes there isn't. Sometimes there's Chavrus' learnings. He said, and it goes to Yishalayim. So a Yiddish house, we're 24 7, there's a Siyanis. 24 7, you're serving Hashem. Every moment is a Shalom Bayez Nisan. Every moment is a, is, is a test, especially before Pesach. In Kedushas Hadibur, in the way you talk, in the, what you look at, in the way you say, in the way you react, how nice you are to your family. It's a 24 7 base Madrash. So for sure, that's going to your Shalom. So there's a story from the Kajan Samagid. The Kajan Samagid used to say three stories every Shabbos Mavarch and Nisan. And he said it's a school for Parnasa. So, school for Panasa, right? That sounds good. Let's jump in. What are the three stories? I'll, t- I'll make it real quick. One story is this man was going and he was schnapping his schnapps, koshla pesach schnapps, which he would sell for pesach. And ma ma osa Hashem, what happened? He runs into these bandits and they decided there's a certain tax you have to pay them for schnapps, and he didn't have the money and they, they, they confiscated it from him. He ran to the Rebbe Melech. He said, "I have no Panasa, What am I going to do?" So the Rebbe Melech told him, "Go tell him it's water." So he runs back, he tells them it's water. It's water. They drink it, they go, yeah, it's water. Blah. They give it all back to him. I'm sure what are you slapping water for? So he runs back to the Rebbe Melech. He says, I'm in trouble. He says, why are you in trouble? He says, my schnapps is water. I'm not going to sell it for Pesach. He says, taste it again. He tastes it again, it's schnapps. Okay? The second story is that he said as a school for Parnassa is the pirates comes around to this Yid and he says to him, oh, you're doing pretty good because I'm your boss. He says, you're my shliach, I have a karsa type to you, I have gratitude, but my real boss is a Kaddish Baruch Hu. He's the one that gives Parnassa. Really? Okay. Pirate says, don't pay him a red cent, no paycheck, next six months, it's frozen. But it's before Pesach, good, we'll see. Come to me and tell me it's me, not Hashem. So the Yid doesn't give in. I'm sure you know the old story. The pirates are sitting there and he has a pet monkey. And the pirates is biting his coins to make sure that they're coins. They used to bite coins to, to see if, because coins had intrinsic value. So if it was too weak, it would bend, you knew it wasn't a real coin. So the pirates is biting his coins. I don't know if the pirates knew this, but he knew you're supposed to bite your coins. And he's biting his coins and the monkey see, monkey see, monkey do. So the monkey ate the coins. And apparently it doesn't do well with the monkey's digestive system. The monkey died. So he says, you know, I'm going to scare the Yid a little bit. I'm going to dress him up in, in like, a, like, a, like a little boy. He'll think that it's a blood libel. Throws the dead monkey through the window. Everyone's frightened. And they see it's a monkey. It's not a person. There's coins all over the place. And he has lerachza. He has a seder. You can invite the whole town. Pirates comes to see how the Jew's doing Friday night. He sees, what? How did you get this? He says, you sent it to me and your monkey. You sent me your coins. And the third story is that uh, there was a year. He had nothing for Pesach. Mamish, nothing. And the king said to him, his wife said to him, oh, king, wife, same thing, whatever. And his wife said to him, uh, please go and, you know, find money for Pesach. I don't know where to find money. Find money for Pesach. I don't know where to find money. Go find it. I don't find money for Pesach. So he hears, he passes by. He says the king lost his ring. And the king is saying, whoever is going to look for his ring is going to give a lot of money. So he comes up. His wife says, go, you're looking for the ring. I don't know how to go. How are you looking for the ring? 
you have to look for the ring, king gives the money. Meanwhile, there was a king and a minister who hated Jews. He said to him, ah, your majesty, he took, the, he took the money, he's partying with it. He has no intention of ever looking for the ring. So they come to his house, and this minister's last name was Tayenu, right? And they come home, they're all sitting together, and they start singing, Dai, Dai. And, and the way he would, told, he, would, he, he would tell them about this, he would tell them different Torah, and they would all sing, Dai, Dai. That's how they did it. So the king comes by. He wants to show the king that they're partying with his money. He sees their own consultation. They scream, Dayenu, Dayenu. He says, ah, they're thinking who stole the money. They're analyzing the results of their investigation. It's you, me, no, no. And they look in his room, and sure enough, they find the ring. You have to understand the Yisoyed in these three stories. In story number one, how many times does our schnapps turn into water? And we're saying, Kodesh Baruch what are you doing to me? And if you believe that the schnapps turns into water when it has to turn into water, then you will understand it turns into water to save your life. You will understand that your partner embezzles you, so you have to become a citizen and you save your family. But a Kaddish Baruch Hu works on his timetable. But if you believe this has to be a means that's going to lead to an end, then your zoicha to the time that it comes back to schnapps. Then your zoicha to the time that you realized you saved your family. But if you don't believe that this world has a beginning and the end and the middle is just in the Nisiyayness, then you're stuck in the middle. Then you're stuck in the Nisiyayness. And it doesn't go any weiter. In the second story, the story with the monkey, he had to go through a certain amount of pacha to have that parnasa. And when he sees a child coming in, another blood libel, he's finished, there has to be that moment of pacha where HaKadosh Baruch Hu, okay, I'm putting everything on hold. My life is in your hands. You got it. Bunch of says, now I could help you. Now I could help you. That's the moment of pachad that we need. And in story number three, okay, you know, go do it. Why should I do it? It's not going to work anyway. Do it. I don't have to look for a ring. Tell the king, you're looking for the ring. Put the ball into motion. HaKadosh Baruch will allow it to roll. These mitzayroim, you're in the work of, it can't be worse than a mitzayra, and a mitzayra that you're cursed at oilam, and you're in a terrible, terrible situation. And yet you say, you know what? We can give up and die, or we can try and die. We have to try. Once you say that, the fact that these people were mitzayroim, the fact they were in the worst, and they still have a courage to say, we have to try, that opens up Yeshua's. It opens up Simchas. And they come back and they say, you know, the, uh, the, the machna varam, it's all available. Who says it's all available? I'm telling you, it's all available. Go get it. And they don't believe them yet. Because to, you have to be zoichet to give over a psura taiva to my meshgiach zazayin gazunt. When your person gives over a psura taiva, a nitzvot of aliyoy goes into him. And, 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 and they don't give up. And they say, please, go check it out. And they have this idea to go check it out. It's a process. It's a long process. But that's what Pesach is. So, finally, our story. I think we say it once a year, but... There was a fellow that uh, he, every year before Pesach, he came home with new chumras. New chumras, great. And his wife said, that once he came home with a big board, we're going to put this on our tables. After we cash her, scrape it down, we're going to have this board on our table. She goes, I don't need a board, I need food! She said, you know, my, and she's like, I need a shlamazel, you know, a husband, you're not a breadwinner, you're not a matzah winner, you're not nothing. And he goes, and he, just, he goes out to look for more chumras. And... The night of Pesach, finally people, good people, helped him, and it's a beautiful Seder table, it's all set, it's gorgeous, it's so beautiful. He goes off to shul, they winch themselves, get yantiv. She turns around, and part of her apron got caught in a snag on his extra board that he put on the table. And as she turns around, boom, the entire table crashes. Everything gone. The eggs become crashed eggs. He's Mekayim, uh, Yachatz, on basically everything on the table that's there. The left go out, and he comes home, and his wife gives it to him. She takes him apart piece by piece and limb by limb, and he's about to answer back, and he says, <laughs> I'm a Shlomazel. I'm in your hands. I'm not going to answer back. And he sits down and listens to her. He gets on the floor, slowly starts picking up the broken eggs, and she picks up the broken eggs, and he picks up the broken matzahs, and she picks up the broken matzahs. And they put everything back on the table, and they slowly relight the left, and they sit down. And then the Kedusha slave, he said, you know, someone, Berka, had a bigger, nicer seder than me. He was piled more rachman. Berka, see him a kubel? Nah, what is he? He knows how to pick up broken eggs. You know what I mean? This is, this is our, this is what Pesach is for us. We're all a little bit of Berka within us. And sometimes the husband is the barrack, sometimes the wife is the barrack, she's the one that puts up with the husband, it goes both sides. And more important than that is we have to put up with ourselves. But when we're willing to say, 
listen, to sit and do nothing, I put the ball into play. Where it's all going to lead to, Rabbi Nishalem, that's in your hands. Then we are zaycha to see, we're zaycha to see the Yeshua's. You know, it says, Esav, Yaakov gave him to eat. So it says, Yaakov gave him to eat, and it says, Esav ate and drank. He ate and drank. What did he drink? It doesn't say Yaakov gave him to drink. So the Yashuk says he always had a bottle of wine in his pocket just in case someone gives him to eat. So they said, Reb uh, Cheskel Abramsky said, you know what we have to learn from this? You always have to keep a bottle of wine in your pocket. You have to wake up in the morning and say, one day, let me be ready. Let me be ready for that Suda Saita. And you'll be, so pr- be surprised how quickly we use that wine. And we'll be zaycha to come from the Dalit Mitzrayim, go through the process of the Dalit Banim, to go through the process of the Dalit Kaisis, of the Hitzalti, and all the way up until the Vilakachti, this Seder. You've just experienced another Torah class brought to you by TorahAnytime.com.